Okay, we'll get started. I think first, um, this will be the second to last lecture, and the last one, just to quickly review, uh, some of you guys were here, some not. Um, we talked about next generation sequencing platforms, the different technologies that are out there. So I'm just going to take maybe five minutes to review, just to organize it for you a little bit better, because I kind of just spit out a bunch of companies and maybe didn't really organize it well into uh, the different strategies that they use. Uh, so maybe that will be helpful. And then the rest of the, the talk will be on uh, NGS assays. How, how do you go about using uh, next generation sequencing, say, for clinical molecular diagnostics? So we have um, next gen... Sequencing. So if you break it down, this is all on the fly here, there are really kind of two, two different strategies. One is cluster-based sequencing, and the other one is single molecule sequencing. On the cluster-based sequencing side, you have those that rely on EMPCR and those that rely on uh, clustering. So I would say um, surface clustering. Down the line there might be other methods. Actually there's a third one that I, I didn't mention. This is based on uh, rolling circle amplification. EMPCR belongs to 454 ion torrent. Surface-based chemistry here, in terms of clustering, is uh, Illumina or Selexa. This one I did I didn't really talk about. Uh, it's a company called Complete Genomics. Reason why I didn't talk about it is it's they are a sort of um, service company. They don't sell any instruments. They have their own in-house instrument. Um, their method is very similar to Illumina. But instead of using a uh, sort of glass slide or chip to populate locally uh, a cluster of amplicons, they do um, they make a circle and they do a rolling circle amplification and they create sort of this ball of um, concatenated amplicons and that gets deposited into wells and then they sequence by a similar ch uh, chemistry to Illumina, which is sequencing by synthesis. Um, in the cluster-based sequencing, you have, I guess, maybe another, how should I draw this to make it, like some of these strategies are mainly based on sequencing by synthesis, sequencing by synthesis, sequencing by synthesis, but EMPCR has something unique. Uh, in the solid technology, which is ABI, this is sequencing by ligation. So it's sort of, I'm trying to break it down, but that, that's the best I can do there. Um, so most of the things that we do are sequencing by synthesis uh, in terms of methods. So for single molecule sequencing, there's really no cluster to generate. So if you want to break this down, there is now a sequencing by synthesis method that is based on two strategies. One is from Pacific Biosciences. It's a single molecule sequencing technology. And then the other one is Helicos. I think I just got a little bit into that, right, the last time in terms of Helicos. So those are both single molecule sequencers. Um, that is sequencing by synthesis. Then you have those where it's nanopore based, and the only one right now is Oxford uh, Nanotechnology. And here, single molecule sequencing, there's something on the horizon which is a little bit newer, um, and that is by, I guess, it's basically hybridization. And I this company is called NAPS, I might be misspelling this, NAPSIS. 
I didn't really get too, too much into here, but this is a company that can stretch out a piece of DNA very long. They can hybridize different colored oligos to it. And by just doing a flow-based kind of like method or strategy, they can actually sequence that, that molecule. Yeah. So these are sort of the major, major kind of organization of the different sequencers. But uh, it, there's many more who are going to come about, um, maybe not so much worth spending time on uh, today. But by far, I would highlight some of the key ones that are basically closer to clinical application, and that would definitely be Illumina is one of the major players. Solid, so-so. Um, they're not very well in terms of document. I mean, uh, dominating the market. They hold a very small portion of the sequencing market. Ion Torrent is promising, and 454 maybe. Maybe uh, in terms of clinical applications, um, their throughput is just not very high right now, and the emulsion PCR is quite difficult to perform on the 454 system. So Ion Torrent is probably going to win out. Um, this is sort of a depreciating sort of technology right now in terms of 454. Uh, but other than that, uh, the other systems are not quite ready for clinical application. Like here, they only offer whole human genome sequencing. They don't even offer an instrument that you can put in your CLIA lab. This one, the error rate is very high, 15%. Uh, like I mentioned, this is probably 5 to 7% error. It's just way too much, uh, not clinically applicable. These are still unknowns right here. So today, really, it boils down to these two companies, and that's why in the news and in, in all of the sort of technology sector, um, you'll, you'll hear a lot of debates between those, those two technologies. They're basically going head-to-head -head right now. Uh, trying to compete uh, in the sequencing market. Any questions? Yeah, I went over kind of the details last time about the chemistry, et cetera. This is just to kind of briefly overview the different strategies. So if, if it all boils down, is really sequencing by synthesis or sequencing by ligation and then directly detecting the, the base somehow by um, current fluctuations as nanopore. Those are the three sort of main main strategies out there. And you can break it down by these two methods here as well. So with that, I'll jump into assays and applications. But I think we have to do a little bit of math to make to um, have it make a little sense here. So let's just start with um, the easy thing. The easy thing is to take the entire human genome and do whole genome sequencing. So last time we talked about how to construct a library, right? You fragment the DNA, put on left and right adapters. So here's your genomic DNA. You shear it in some form or fashion, enzymatically, by sonication or whatever. And the hope is that you put on your left and right adapter onto each of these fragments to kind of normalize, equalize them. And then you just put this through sequencing. So that would be whole human genome sequencing. There, there's no selection here. There's no targeting. It's just taking everything um, as is uh, in, in the library prep. So let's just go back and let's just say, you remember how big the human genome is per cell? What's the number? Yeah, roughly six times 10 to the ninth basis. So that's six billion bases per cell. And if you were to try and do a, um, let's say, let's just take a germline condition, not even cancer, and you want to sample about 30, 30 fold. So each base you want, so this is the base here, you want 30 of these sort of fragments to cover this one base so you can make a pretty uh, confident call in terms of a heterozygous mutation. Uh, you can go back. Google a power calculator, and indeed, if you have a 50% allele and maybe 1% error, you can throw it in, and it will probably spit out about 30x. I mean, maybe even you can get away with 20, 25. But 30 will be a pretty good quality coverage uh, whole human genome sequencing uh, experiment. So if you did this, then you multiply this, right? Uh, what is that? That will be 1.8 times 10 to the what? 11th, is that right? Which is 180 uh, tera, sorry, not tera, 
sorry, I'm going too high there. 180 giga bases, right? Let's take the main player right now because nobody else really com competes on the same level other than solid, but let's not talk about solid. Let's just talk about the high seek uh, 2000. This is the one where you can run two chips side by side. After a 10 day run, you can generate earlier this year, maybe late last year, maybe 200 gigabases. They're pushing now 400 and maybe by the end of this year up to even 600 gigabases or so with changes in chemistry, denser clustering, etc. So that means that on this one run here, um, let's just say this one chip, you can maybe do one or two individuals, right? Let me butcher that. Individuals. That um, is based on a whole human genome sequencing experiment. Can you see why this is probably not going to be applicable at this time? Point in time is it, it takes you 10 days you get this much amount of data and you're only able to run one or two individuals with one instrument and this instrument is going to cost you seven eight hundred thousand dollars and that's that's not very efficient right so whole human genome sequencing to me in my opinion and hopefully you would agree is still really in the sort of research kind of phase right now um, but even if you have a powerhouse like uh, Beijing Genome Institute, BGI, who has, I think, a hundred and something high seq 2000s, it, it, it's, it's a struggle for them to keep up with capacity. If you wanted to sequence, say, 10 patients a week, 20 a week, I mean, you, you need something like BGI, and that's a huge, huge operation. Um, I think they have 1,500 bioinformaticians or something like that. It's, it's ridiculous how, how big they are. But as a small clinical lab like us, the most we can afford is maybe one high seek, if even. I mean, you can't crank through whole human genome sequencing. And for cancer, we've talked a lot in the beginning about sampling, right? Um, a little bit. I mean, you really want in the range of 200 to 500 fold X fold coverage, something like that. And can you imagine how many high seek runs it would take at the whole human genome sequencing level to get the amount of sampling you need to detect down to, say, 5, 10% of low frequency? That's why it's not going to work for cancer either. Um, although places are proposing that they should do whole human genome sequencing. But other than just say technically, you can't achieve this realistically with the amount of volume you have. What, what is the other big deal about doing whole human genome sequencing? Yeah. Interpretation. So interpretation uh, is difficult. Uh, any guesses how much of the whole human genome is actually coding? Roughly 1% are your exons or coding. What are the rest uh, of the 99% uh, here? Introns, promoter regions, enhancer regions, uh, I guess non-coding RNAs, uh, long non-coding RNAs, microRNAs, lots of satellites, lots of repeats, microsatellites, things that we don't necessarily know how to interpret at this point in time. So the highest yield at this moment is to actually not do whole human genome sequencing. One, it's expensive. Oh, I forgot to throw in the price. This one run is probably going to be about twelve to $15,000. So one, is too expensive. Technically, you can't achieve it realistically. And thirdly, the interpretation is much too difficult. And from this one run, this data here is going to be about one terabyte. Storage is also an issue, right? That's just the raw data, by the way. So your A, T's, and G's in FASTQ format is going to amount to that much. And then when you do the analysis, multiply this times 3 times 4 times 5. And that's the intermediate file size that you're working with. After you map and, and align, BAM files is another terabyte. You do some other crazy things with the data, another terabyte. Then you t finally generate a VCF file. That's probably going to be on the gigabyte level at, at this level here. So it's a lot of data, costly, technically not feasible, very hard to interpret. Everything is against doing whole human genome sequencing at this, this point in time. So what can you do? You can do this 1%, right? So if you collectively put all of this together, this will equate to the exome. So let's talk about sequencing the exome. Any questions for whole genome sequencing?
So the exome will be your coding regions, right? Any guesses how many genes we have? 30, yeah, about 20, 25. It may go up, it may go down. At one point, I think, prior to the completion of human genome, we thought there were 100,000 genes in the, <laughs> in the genome. So luckily that number has boiled down to be a little bit more manageable at 20,000. Um, roughly, you know how many exons? It's about 180,000 exons. So these will be... You have your introns, you have your exons, intron, exon, intron. And maybe there's some, let me just draw an arrow here, some enhancer or promoter region upstream of that. So you have about 180,000 of these. Now the question is, how do you go about targeting this? And we're actually starting at, at a, v, a very difficult extreme, right? Um, but let, let me just throw out there, let's say PCR. Let's try to design a PCR for the whole exon. Is that possible? Because you, yeah, you can try. <laughs> you can try, right? So how would you do it? Put a left primer in front, right primer there, left here, right here. Hopefully, you know, you'll have off-target binding of the primers. You'll have primer dimers, etc. But that's designed 180,000 primer pairs to target the entire. Um, the, the entire exome. Just the mRNA. You could. You could do, um, okay, let's talk about mRNA while we're at it, right? So these will be expressed, right? And so what is, okay, and these will be uh, Mother Nature's version so that she'll go ahead and splice for you what you need to know, right? So let's just say, here's the third exome over here. So why not use the mRNA. We have overlapping rulings because of alternate splicing and stuff like that. Yeah, splicing is an issue. Uh, that's, that's fine. There's a bigger can, issue. You cannot keep out like um, microRNAs and... Yeah, microRNAs, that's, that's an issue. Yeah, There's a bigger issue though. Not every cell expresses every RNA. It's right. like 10,000. So let's say, you know, you have um, your brain, right? Hopefully that looks like a brain. <laughs> <laughs> um, this one gene is actually expressed in the brain, and that's the one with the mutation. So here's a gene, spliced nicely for you. Here's the mutation. Are you going to bi biopsy the brain and <laughs> do sequencing on that? No, the best you can do is the easiest thing we talked about in the first lecture in terms of sample acquisition is uh, getting blood, right? Um, skin, maybe it's a little bit more painful, more accessible. But the problem with mRNA is unless you're, you have the disease cells that express it, you're not going to be able to get it. But yeah, this is one option. That would be sort of sub-exome. Uh, not every cell expresses every gene, and I don't even know what that number is, the subset of genes, but I can't imagine this being any higher than what, 10, 15%? 10, for people generally. Okay, yeah, I mean, there, there'll be some housekeeping genes that are always on in every cell, but uh, the important genes are turned off or on depending on what tissue needs it and what uh, cells need it. So mRNA probably would not be the best way to do whole exome sequencing. So you. The, the problem with PCR is that it doesn't scale well, right? So you, you can't use PCR. Uh, too hard to design, too hard to multiplex. Uh, you don't want to be running 180,000 tubes. That's going back to the, the human genome project days, right, in terms of assay scale. You want it to do in one tube, maybe two, maybe three, but no more than that. So PCR is out of the question. Um, really, when it boils down to doing the whole exome, um, I think, as far as I can tell, the only people who have attempted this have only used hybridization as a method to, to capture the, the exome. So hybridization is probably the one and only method right now that I know of that you can do whole exome sequencing. So again, you start with whole, the whole genome, right, from the, the, um, from the DNA sample for, from the patient, peripheral blood, et cetera, you extract it. And if you were to take this as it is and try to capture the exons, it's not going to be very efficient, right? Because you have mostly this one chromosome, for example, contains only 1% on average, right? 1% of your the coding region per chromosome. Um, it's probably, the number is much more variable than that, depending on what chromosome you're looking at. 
But if you were to try to capture this, you can pull out everything else uh, in terms of the introns, the promoter regions, the satellites. So the best thing to do is first to still use the whole human genome sequencing strategy and fragment this down into more, a more workable size. And still do your library construction with the adaptive ligation. And then now, perhaps this, I'm going to color this differently. Perhaps this is the piece that you're looking for. This is the one here. That's the one there. And the rest is junk. There's 99% of junk that you don't really care about when you're trying to do the whole exome. And so the strategy that was used initially, I would say, not very long ago, 2006, 2007, 2007, 2008, or something like that, was people had experience with microarrays. And we did talk about microarrays, right, in terms of being, um, you know, have millions of spots designed clonally, each spot with the oligos that you're trying to target. Um, so the first thing they did was, oh, what if I just did a microarray experiment? I know microarrays can capture what I'm looking for, right, because I use it to do DNA copy number detection. I use it to do gene expression, and I can target pretty specific regions, regions of the genome. But instead of capturing and just detecting signal, why don't I just capture these tidbits here and elude it off of the, the chip or the slide? And then now I've done sort of a filtering method. Uh, I'm using almost like a sieve, uh, like a colander almost, to capture what I need and let all the junk and water go through. So what they do is they design an oligo that's whole exome. I mean, uh, they design oligos that represent the whole exome on this chip here. And essentially what you do is you fragment the DNA, ligate everything together. Um, you can probably do some PCR enrichment to increase the amount of material that you're putting into the system. And then just allow this to hybridize. So things that are not targeted will just not hybridize. And things that are targeted, so the red pieces that I drew, let's say these are the adapters here, will hybridize like that. You do this, you do a washing step, um, hybridized probably would take days, 40 hours, 36 hours, very typical of a race CGH experiments. Um, you wash out the junk and then you can just elude it. You can probably add some sodium hydroxide solution or you can put in a high heat temperature as a way to strip, you're basically just stripping the chip right here. Uh, something that we do in the lab, you know, to reuse chips, but you can use it this way to do whole exome sequencing. Um, and then once you loop this into a, a two, you'll have the captured stuff. Maybe you have some off-target binding as well, but hopefully that's minimal. And then this is what you put through sequencing. So if you were to boil it down, let's just do some numbers again. The 180,000 exons or the 20-something thousand genes boil down to roughly about 50 megabases. That's it drastic difference, right, from uh, six gigabases, I don't know, yeah, it's one percent, right, roughly one percent. So now this becomes a little bit better, right? So let's do that high seek run again. The high seek 2000 run will give you, let's just say right now it's, it's good at 50, I mean 500 uh, gigabases. That's 500,000 make a basis and so what is this I think I need to multiply this times 30 right I still want 30 fold X coverage to get the heterozygous mutations that I'm calling this is 1500 you guys can help me with the math here this will be about 30 something mm -hmm. or more 300 about 300. You can do about 300 cases. That's pretty good. So I can probably do 300 patients in one high seek run. And you know, if you want a little bit better quality, let's say, let's go up to like, I don't know, 60 expo coverage or something like that. Uh, capture is not always, um, so I should mention that, capture is not always perfect. You're not going to get something like this. So let's say this is your, your capture right here. You're not going to get things that are completely even like this. What you're going to get out is probably something like this. So 
some things are overrepresented, underrepresented, etc. So to balance it out, you're probably going to want a little bit better than this. So maybe even 100 exfil coverage average. And if you did that, you'll be down to, you know, maybe 100 cases or something, which is not terrible. So you can probably get through um, the number of cases that, that we would need to do um, for germline, for germline, not, not for cancer. So for that, this makes more sense. Um, and the only problem was back then, maybe in 2008, 2009, the cost per chip was probably around $1,000 or $1,500 per capture. That's very, very expensive. And so um, the first folks who did, um, to, who, who took kind of this method, this idea, and then made it even better was the Broad. Uh, the group was led by Grinerke, and they came up with a way that they could do whole exome sequencing. But instead of doing a 2D surface for capture, so this is a 2D surface, right? And it's a lot more difficult to expect mixing. Mixing is always better in a 3D environment, you know, in, in solution. So this restricts things, and that's why you need uh, this sort of rotisserie that's spinning for 40-something hours, is to get all of the mixing well done so that it has equal chance of binding the, the target. Um, for each probe, because you would want to say, you know, I want exon 2 of this gene number 1 here, and over here all the way in this corner. No, in order to get that even mixing, you need to do it for a long time, relatively high heat, and also um, uh, have it spinning because it's a 2D surface. But if you were to convert this into a in-solution-based method, it would be a whole lot better. So to do that, what they did was... Um, I think that maybe they overthought it a little bit, but they said, okay, let's cleave off these, uh, let's take a chip, but just cleave it off. So now we have the baits or the oligos on solution now. But they went a step further and said, instead of using DNA, I'm going to convert this to RNA. And how exactly did they do that? They designed these oligos to have tags on here, common tags. One purpose is the common tags, you can replenish them, right? By just doing PCR of this entire pool, they're all about 120 mer, I believe. By doing PCR of this, you can replenish your pool and use it over and over again. But at the same time, I can put in a promoter, a T7 promoter, which will, in the presence of RNA polymerase, can give you a system for in vitro transcription. In vitro transcription will allow you to make RNA from these DNA templates. But during the process, they spike in a DUTP, and uh, Alex did a nice homework and found out why we use DTP, uh, DUTP. It's just because of the cross-linking and the chemistry is much easier with DUTP than the other uh, um, nucleotides that you use. But this, you know, we're familiar with this for um, fish probes in terms of labeling red or green. But in this case, they biotinylate this, DUTP. And what you'll do is you'll create a soup of RNA. So now it has U's in here, which are bitinylated, and these become your baits. So what you do is same thing, whole human genome sort of library construction, shotgun uh, library construction here, left and right adapter. Instead of hybridizing it to a 2D surface, now you can put this into a PCR tube. I forget what volume it is, um, but your base will be in here along with your DNA. So I'm going to draw DNA in, in green here. And this works a lot better because things are better mixed. And actually, you don't even have to mix it. The heat itself you know, during the process allows you to have mixing just uh, purely based on the energy that's input by the heat and the browning motion and all that gets your mixing going. So you don't need to, this rotisserie kind of system. Uh, you still do it at roughly 65 degrees Celsius, um, but now you can cut it down maybe to a 16-hour hybridization, perhaps even better a 24-hour hybridization instead of doing it over days and days. And that's uh, basically what Gnerke did at the Broad. He commercialized this through Agilent, and so they came up with the Sure Select kit. And they've gone through now four different versions. The version one, which was 30-something megabases, 
to version two, I think version two three, which was about 50 megabases, and then now they have a version four, which is targeting 50 megabases, and they did another rendition, which is a 70 megabase one, where they also included the five prime and three prime UTR, so a little bit of the promoter region to get you extra information. So coding, but also some regulatory elements in the, in the latest um, version of it. So that's your select, and then um, they sort of have been dominating the market in terms of exome capture baits and sequencing for the last, I guess, three, four years now. Um, then other people started to join in the game. Uh, Roach Nibujin, who uh, I guess more Nibujin than Roach. Roach acquired Nibujin. Nibujin is a DNA printing. Um, company, they can print it on chips, they will do your gene expression chips, I think they have a SNP chip as well. Um, but same thing, just like Agilent, Agilent has a nice oligo printing kind of business uh, on their chips. So they printed it on there, but they say, forget about the RNA, I'll just use DNA. So that's what they did, is they designed their baits uh, on the DNA level, but instead of going 120 mers, they do much shorter, I forget how long their baits are. I'm just guessing here, maybe 60 or 90 or something, much shorter baits. And I, I, they also use the biotinylation and et cetera uh, of these oligos. Uh, <coughs> but they say, you know, let's, let's not use RNA. I forgot the other process here after hybridization when you use RNA is you can use RNAs as a way to cleave away your baits. So on this side, they can't use DNAs, right? Because <laughs> your library with DNA, you don't want to cleave off. So they probably use some very uh, stringent washing conditions along with maybe um, a magnetic um, strep avidin sort of system with the biotin to make sure that they don't um, carry over the, the baits. But even if you do carry over the baits, it's not a big deal because the usually the <coughs> final step after capture is you do a PCR enrichment step. So anything that does not have your adapters, which will be the baits, will not get amplified. So this will be over amplified compared to your baits. So I think that's how you get around it. So Rolf Nemergen jumped into the game, uh, and then very recently Illumina as well. Illumina is known for their chips and their um, SNP genotyping chips in the GWAS days. So they can print chips for uh, SNP genotyping. I don't believe they have a copy number. They have a gene expression one. Uh, I don't think they have a DNA copy number chip as far as I know. But same thing, company with a printer that can print oligos to very high throughput capacity. They also jumped into the game of designing a whole exome kit. Um, but in, instead of using RNA, which is uh, sure select, they also follow Roche Nimogen strategy, which is just to use DNA as well. So now you have three versions here that allow you to do um, allow you to do uh, whole exome capture. Any questions so far? So these will get you the big, big targets. Um, it used to cost, I mean, if you order a kit of like eight reactions or 12, it's gonna be expensive. Um, probably back in the day, probably even six, $700 per capture, which will outscale the cost of sequencing. So library construction right now is still sort of the higher cost in terms of the entire process. Nowadays, uh, there's a pricing war, so competition is always always good. By Roach and um, uh, Roach Nimogen and Illumina jumping into the game, now sure select you can probably order. Um, I think if you just order 16 reactions, the price is around 290 bucks per capture. So it's dropped dramatically, and I expect it to drop even more uh, by next year as as there's uh, more competition heating up. So that's on the thousands and thousands of um, gene level in terms of target capture. If you move down into the hundreds of genes, uh, there's another alternative strategy that Agilent just acquired, um, which is called Haloplex. And for, say, other applications where we want more than just, say, you know, 100 expo coverage, let's say I wanted 500 expo coverage. This is going to be a costly exome experiment, right? And this application is more for like uh, cancer genotyping. Um, I, I guess I don't need to go into this anymore, right? You just need high sampling to get the sensitivity that you need analytically to detect 
low-lying variants. So you need much higher coverage. This is probably a, a difficult experiment to do by whole exome capture, especially to get even coverage throughout all the targets. Um, so I would venture to say right now, maybe one day exome sequencing will be sort of the way to do tumor genotyping, but for right now, we probably want to target hundreds of genes um, uh, for cancer genotyping. So Haloplex is one option, which is now owned by Agilent. I'm going to run through this very quickly. They have some algorithm or software that can take the whole human genome and design um, a combination of restriction enzymes that will cleave the DNA and hoping that your exon that you're trying to target is somewhere in this sort of whole scheme of things. So based on, I think, eight enzymes or something like that, they can design this, this, um, this sort of restriction enzyme digest. And basically, in the end, you have sticky ends that, that uh, result from this, right? Then they put in a basically a, an oligo or a duplex oligo that will ligate the target regions that you're trying to target and circularize it. Based on known sequences of this right here, they're going to do rolling circle amplification of this to amplify it up. So it's an amplification-based method to get the target that you're trying to do. Um, I'm not going to go into too much more details about this, but it's, um, it's a system that seems to work pretty well in terms of on-target, off-target specificity, uh, I mean, just on-target specificity, and in terms of balance, it's a little bit better, I think, than the Agilent uh, Sure Select system. Um, so it's a method that relies, the specificity is completely dependent on the restriction digest, um, and finding a combination that works well for the, the bulk of your targets. So a limitation of this is that, you know, if your target doesn't have your restriction enzyme and, you know, whatnot, uh, then it, it, it probably would not work. Or let's say if your exon is here and the restriction enzymes that you're using is way, way out there, you're probably going to target some regions that will give you wasted kind of sequencing. Um, so it's something that's on the horizon. They just officially launched, I think, a few months ago through Agilent, uh, and it's an option uh, if you want to do hundreds of, of genes. So other methods for capturing... When you get to this level, is there's one option through um, let me just write down what I talked about. So more like sure select hybrid capture, and I can roll in Roche Imogen and Illumina to here. This is Haloplex, which is the um, restriction enzyme rolling circle amplification one. So three is essentially just using microfluidics doing uh, essentially emulsion PCR. And this will be rain dance. So when you get down to a, a few hundred genes, the number of exons that you're dealing with uh, or targets probably equate to no more than 2,000, maybe 5,000 reactions. It's still out of our realm in terms of a lab to design. But if you could sort of com compartmentalize these reactions and miniaturize them much smaller, it's actually doable to design um, PCR for this. Not multiplex, but just singleplex PCR. So how do you do this? Rain Dance is a company founded by none other than Jonathan Rothberg as well. Um, he, I guess, had friends or himself who were into the microfluidic um, sort of technology. So they designed a system. Um, Quite, I mean, it's kind of simple to think about, and you should definitely go on the Rain Dance website to look at their videos. Uh, but what they do is they take the human genome DNA and they fragment it down so that you actually they don't fragment. They they just take the DNA itself, still intact, uh, intact uh, chromosomes, and I guess after DNA extraction, whatever intact uh, chromosome there are, they just keep it as is. But they have they inject this into their system on one port, okay? And this system, there's a method here, I just based on microfluidics, I don't know how they do it, but they have gates that can open and close, etc. But probably they mix it with oil on one end, and they're able to generate the exit from here, an aqueous volume that contains roughly one third of the genome. So this will be one reaction right here. 
So it's going through and it's basically uh, doing aliquoting of the DNA, uh, roughly on average one third of the genome per droplet. So these are droplets. You have mostly oil here and an aqueous uh, in, in those uh, reaction volumes. On the other side, they have already created for you an emulsion of PCR primers. And this will have your left and right adapt. I mean, left and right PCR primers in there. So as part of the design is you say, oh, I want to do you to design the 5,000 exons that I'm trying to target. Here's the coordinates or the genomic sequence. Uh, please design for me. And they have an oligosynthesis sort of um, service that, that will produce this. It's expensive, but they will give you a tube that will have probably... 5,000 of these sort of um, PCR, drop, uh, PCR primer droplets times however many thousands and gazillions in, in, in this one tube. And they feed this into another channel like this. So these will march in succession and meet up with this. So if I were to color code it, maybe these are green. Each one is a different PCR primer set, and the DNA ones will be red. So they meet up and they basically get sucked in together. <laughs> I'll just hold it. It's just too many to deal with. Um, they kind of merge together and then form one reaction. So you can imagine these two are mixed together now. And I don't know what the size is, maybe picoliters, maybe a little bit larger nanoliter, perhaps, but it's big enough to support a PCR reaction with all of the polymerase, the DNTPs. I think those are mixed on this side. Polymerase, DNTPs are mixed with the DNA, so you might maybe have another channel, the oil or whatever come in here. Maybe there's PCR reagents, which meet up with the DNA. And then when you merge these together, now you have a PCR reaction, right, going on here. So this all gets dumped into um, a PCR tube, and then now you have millions and gazillions of these PCR reactions that you just put onto a thermal cycler, rev up and down, do your 35 cycles. So essentially you miniaturize PCR into such minuscule volumes that you can multi, it's technically not multiplexing the same reaction, but multiplex across many different reactions and be able to do the hundreds of gene targets that you're, you're trying to detect. So the one issue with this is the instrument to do this process right here, and this, actually this is done by the company, but this portion here is about $250,000. It's, it's almost the price of a next-gen sequencer. Um, definitely halfway there for the big ones. Uh, Proton actually will be cheaper, than, or about this price or cheaper. So it's really competing with the price of a, a sequencer. But all it does is just this step right here, is just to create your um, micro droplets for you. This portion right here, I forget what the price is. I think at this scale, they're probably gonna charge you on the order of 500 to maybe $700 per reaction or something like that. So you order this up front, you need to tell them I need 100 samples. If you go higher, the price will drop. But basically they will give it to you and then that's it. If you need to have more, you have to reorder it again, and they will do another batch for you. So the combination of all of this, and in addition to this, this issue right here, is that it's almost a statistical problem that, you know, what are the chances that this will hit and be hitting the one-third of genome that you're targeting? So the coverage is not going to be perfect. You're going to probably have some allelic dropout, some target dropout issues, because it's not going to be 100% uh, uh, efficient. And so we, we thought about this, but the price here and that and um, the need to maintain copy number uh, status in terms of our DNA targets, uh, we decided not to go down this route right here. So that's Rain Dance. Fluidyne is another company that is not as fancy and sexy as Rain Dance, but basically what they do is they have this chip that you can inject uh, one version of their assay, you can inject 48 DNA samples and 48 um, P 
PCR primer pools. And these can, if you design it to be multiplex, it'll be 48 pools, but let's say you do two targets per, per pool, then you can go up to 96 targets, for example. And this is nothing fancy, really. It's, it's just a microfluidic system where, where you inject, I think, 10 microliters of your DNA for each well here, and then 10 microliters of your PCR primers. There's a microfluidic system with gates and channels that basically does the mixing for you. So they would intersect at the appropriate spots. And you take this entire chip into their uh, proprietary um, PCR thermal cycler, and it will cycle it and do your PCR for you. So it's a fancy way of setting up your PCR master mix uh, and DNA and targets. And in the end, uh, when it's done, I think there's some port here that you can inject, and it will spit out the, um, the 48 samples for you. So it will collect all 48 of these distribute it somewhere here, and then port it back so that you can now put this into a, a tube. So it's, again, parallel kind of PCR reactions. The run cost of this ends up being about $7, so it's not bad. The entire chip, I think, is 350 or so dollars. They might have come down in price. Um, but the cost is 7 because, you know, you have 48 samples, so you just divide it across. Uh, we thought about it, but it's not enough targets for us. It's only around 100 or so. And what's that? The instrumental you have to buy. Yes, the instrument you have to buy, I think it's 50K or something like that. Um, just for, I think there's a system that you need to, to load, the, the, to control the microfluidics. And you also need a thermal cycle, which is an, an additional. It's not as expensive as this, but. You could do the same thing in an I-6 well play. It's a little bit more unwieldy. Uh, I didn't see a gain or benefit uh, for doing this. Um, it's not jumping, you know, from snapshot. We're almost doing this number, right, across the patients that we're doing. So it wasn't a huge enough leap for us to jump into this with the added additional uh, cost. So more recently, um, there's been a number of multiplex PCR strategies that have come, up, uh, come about, and there are two that I would just like to quickly go into. One is the AmpliSeq from IonTorn, and then the second one is the TrueSeq Amplicon. So I tell you in the beginning that you know, to do the entire exome is very difficult for a whole exome um, by PCR. But if you, you know, only had a few hundred targets, uh, 300, 400 targets, these two folks have come up with a strategy that they believe can even work for 1,000 or 2,000 targets. Uh, so this will be competing with the fluid dime system, uh, the um, brain dance sort of system. So AmpliSeq is a one-tube assay that they, it's proprietary how they do it, but this is my guess how they do it. They basically have a primer pool of your forward and reverse reactions on one tube. And what I believe they do is they have tags that this uh, common tags on all their primers. So what it helps you do is when you are doing PCR amplification this way, let's say you get a primer dimer that forms like that. What's going to happen is this primer dimer forms and it will create a complementary, right? On both ends like this. When this goes to melt, it's going to create a hairpin like that because the ends are complementary. Chances are that this will occur if you calculate um, Gibbs free energy of this occurring, this will be much more likely because an intramolecular. Uh, um, interaction. This binding to this, a binding to this target, will happen much less um, frequently. But this happening is orders of magnitude probably higher because it's an intramolecular interaction. In the old days, this is an old technology. Um, this was designed to uh, allow you to do something called PCR suppression. So it's opposite of what you want. But in a multiplex PCR reaction, Typically what is most detrimental to the reaction is primer dimer formation, because these will take over 
But if you have these tags on here, what it will do is suppress this and allow you to do more on-target amplification of your primers. So uh, probably part of their algorithm is they have very good PCR primer design, so there's no off-target or um, minimize this interaction in the first place. But this helps with the PCR suppression. But once you've um, once you have once you have uh, produced your product, and I believe it's, it's got to be um, it's some sort of system like this. Once they've done it, uh, what can happen is they have a restriction enzyme that they probably designed somewhere right here in in the uh, the tag or linker itself, which allows you to cleave. It allows you to cleave the, um, the double-stranded DNA product on both sides, and this now becomes your fragment that you go into next-gen sequencing library construction. And this will be uh, basically just amplicon sequencing. So their kit right now for the AmpliSeq for cancer is um, targeting, I think, 180 targets right now. Um, they said they can go up to two, three thousand by internal design, or whatever. I'm not sure if I believe that, but that's that's one option. Uh, very recently, TrueSeq uh, from Illumina. This is from Illumina, by the way. They came out with a competing technology, also a cancer panel, doing I think three to four hundred targets. So instead of using the PCR suppression uh, by primer design, they do something different that's very similar to MLPA. So what they do is they have the target exons, right, like this, and they design an oligo that hybridizes upstream and downstream. So you can think about these like almost like uh, PCR primers, but they're they're the same sense. So this if this is your target DNA, which is positive sense. You would design an anti sense to that, so a negative um, a sort of uh, anti sense oligo targeting upstream and downstream of, of this target right here. They perform a extension step, so they'll do it for all of the exons that you're trying to target, like this. So these are the tar um, probes or whatever targeting those specific exons. Three prime in, three prime in, three prime in, like that. So they do a primary extension step. Then they do a ligation. If you recall back, MLPA was designed differently, right? MLPA is you have the two oligos sitting right next to each other. You don't need extension. You perform a ligation as a detection step. And then what do you do after that? Multiplex PCR. It's multiplex, but it's because that there are common adapters on the both the left end and the right end. And what you could do is go ahead and add on the adapters, the A and B adapters, for next-gen sequencing. And you can use those as your target primers um, for... Uh, amplifying this up. So I thought initially that this would work very well because it's not um, sort of competing PCR reactions uh, in terms of primers. It's firstly based on this uh, annealing to the target uh, sequence extension with a requisite ligation step as uh, another spe specificity check. And then you do PCR. And I'm willing to bet they did design this so that most of these products are with, fall within the same size range, so that during PCR there's no bias for one versus the other. But it turns out, I think Zhongli you know, did a workshop, uh, or saw a workshop on them. There's quite a bit of variability in terms of coverage. It's, it's something like something like this, where you have probably a 10,000 X-fold coverage versus maybe 1,000 right here. So the the variability is quite wide in terms of coverage, depending on what target. And there were several targets that just didn't work uh, in terms of um, this this targeting and PCR step. What this looks like, uh, which I haven't talked about, is it looks like another technology that was back in maybe 2009 from the Church Lab uh, called the molecular inversion probe uh, kind of technique. So this one is a little bit different in that they did target upstream and downstream with some oligos like this. They do primer extension, they do ligation, but instead of having these two linkers here, this is actually a padlock probe that is one molecule. 
And after this, this forms a circle. Put it in a primer. You can do rolling circle amplification, similar to the complete genomic sort of strategy. And this will create a concatamer, which in the end you can add an oligo, you can cleave that off, and then you have an amplification-based step to target uh, the, the, the different number of targets that they do. So I, based on this, I thought this would be promising, but the coverage looks a bit off um, across all the different targets. Um, I think the church lab was able to prove that you can do up to 50, 60,000 targets with this method here. And they use it mainly for SNP genotyping, uh, not so much whole exon uh, coverage. Because I think there might be some constraints in terms of designing the two uh, targeting all the goals on the ends right here uh, and the size of the, the target. So for the most part, what I've tried to go over today are different technologies and assays for next-gen sequencing. Um, these, some of these might have very limited uh, time span and, and window because as the price of sequencing drops, I, I would, I'm willing to bet that clinically most people would just jump straight to the whole exome for germline genetics, even, even for cancer. But for cancer, it's specific because we need very high coverage. So um, it's a bit difficult to uh, do that at the exome level right now. But as sequencing prices drop, maybe capture prices drop, then that might become a non-issue. But for the time being, I would say the next two years, three years, as the price stay where they are, targeting hundreds of genes uh, will probably be the way to go. And for our lab, what we've done is we've chosen sort of this method here, not any one of these other ones, um, as a way to go forward to design a big cancer panel to genotype all cancers. So it's sort of the, the big jump that we wanted from, from snapshot to, uh, to next-gen sequencing. Um, it's still not easy to analyze hundreds of samples, I mean hundreds of uh, genes at the same time. Um, Analyzing the whole exome is very difficult as well, right? But uh, that's sort of an informatics uh, issue and more of an analysis issue. So tomorrow I'll try to go over some of those methods. And t I mean, just the routine workflow. You're not going to learn uh, from my lecture tomorrow how to <laughs> do bioinformatics, but uh, hopefully it's enough just to understand the complexity and the problems of analysis. Uh, but this, this will be sort of the types of methods that I would think about to, to design an assay uh, going forward for next-gen sequencing. Um, there's a sixth method that I haven't explained. It's something that we're working on internally. That's also multiplex PCR. It's qu quite exciting and very cheap to implement. But because it's not in the pub public domain, I'll leave it at that for now. Um, but otherwise, we uh, are looking at sort of uh, just this right here as a way to go forward for the 800 or 1,000 genes that we want to genotype. Any questions? So tomorrow, same time. We'll start a bit on the analysis. This group may know better the timeline of implementation. What are your goals? You mean in terms of rollout? Yeah. Yeah. So we kind of started stuff. Um, the wet lab component, you can do this all by hand, but there's a lot of infrastructure build out that, that needed to be done. So that's what we started on um, basically December of last year, January of this year. We got the microfluidics, I mean the liquid handler robotics for that, um, the technicians, the bioinformatician, training them. So I think we are at a comfortable level now that you can probably throw any of these technology at us and we can probably implement it. Um, so we're still sort of in the design phase right now and testing things out. So my projection is probably nine months to a year from now is realistically when we'll even be close to rolling out something. Um, I'm hoping that by the end of this fall, maybe the uh, winter, early winter, that we would have narrowed down the gene list, the, the baits, the targets, and then start maybe in the new year validation. Um, and from there on, maybe six months or so uh, to get validation on the way. I haven't even talked about Informatics. Informatics is the bigger bottleneck in all of this. Um, right now we have just one bioinformatician. We're looking to hire an IT person. We have a, a programmer who will help out. But really, we'll, during launch, we're going to need at least two or three bioinformaticians and more support for the informatics. We don't have a cluster. We don't have a computer system. We don't have a database. All of these <laughs> need to be in place before you can launch this asset. Right? It's, it's, it's more complex. And um, the tricky thing about validating a huge NGS assay is that not only you have to validate the wet lab component, but you have to validate also all of the informatics, your analysis tools, the algorithms that you use to make calls, 
and how do you interpret, how do you annotate. It's all part of one big package that, that needs to be validated all together. Um, and version control is very important. You need to lock down your version of the capture assay, the version of your analysis pipeline um, before you can launch uh, clinically. So it's, it's a much more bigger, bigger challenge than uh, any other typical assay that you launch. Uh, we have launched in the lab. The SOP, I know Alex likes to read SOPs, and I think it's going to be at least 500, maybe 1,000 pages, so I think. That's what I'm thinking. <laughs> Haley likes to write SOPs. Alex likes to read them. So <laughs> we'll have a yeah, a pretty hefty SOP um, uh, to, to develop because there's so many complexities in there. But hopefully through a good limb system, through good automation, uh, we can maybe condense some of that down quite a bit. Um, yeah. And the idea for the assay will be all cancers. It's one generic assay. Um, that you can get indels, point mutations, and copy number all at the same time. And that will be the first phase, but thereafter we'll probably consider transcriptome sequencing for rearrangements, uh, methylome sequencing for methylation, um, and as part of CID, you know, we want to also cover the other bases as well in terms of germline conditions, uh, hereditary conditions as well, and pharmacogenetics. So, but the cancer is a low-hanging fruit that we want to get underway.